Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. Let's pray. Our Father, it's this one that you've anointed to be priest forever after the order of Melchizedek that we are here worshiping in his name. We don't worship him merely because he was a good teacher merely because he set a good example to follow, merely because he was a righteous man, merely because he was a humble man, merely because he was the God man. We come to worship him because he died for our sins, according to the scripture, according to the plan hidden in your wisdom from the foundation of the world. He was buried and he rose again, triumphant over death, and the grave and sin and the devil and every enemy that would raise itself up against those who believe on his name, those whom you have called from the Jews and also from the Greeks, your people. Lord, we are here gathered together as an example of that grace that you have displayed so richly, that love which is endless to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for it be praised we pray in jesus name amen amen well i'm not going to do any sort of expositing of psalm 110 but i wanted to read that because verse 4 there says the lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever after the order of melchizedek it's been maintained that psalm chapter 110 verse 1 is the most referenced verse in all of scripture and that says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And that if you were to go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, you'll see those two verses there in succession. They mean much to what the author to the Hebrews is trying to teach and will teach us, God willing, today. Verse 4 of chapter 110 is what we read, and really that's the focus of this service today. And I've called this message, Christ, our guarantor of eternal life. Now that word guarantor, we'll talk about a little bit later, but I want us to understand something when the Bible talks about Jesus as a high priest, I want us to understand that the central duty that the high priest would have was as a mediator between God and his people. He would fulfill this office in a variety of ways. In the Old Testament, the high priest would fulfill it in a variety of ways. And I think central to this, and the most unique of these ways, would be that he alone, the high priest alone, once a year, would be able to go into a place, variety, it's called a variety of things, but one of them is the Holy of Holies. And he would offer up the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat there. 
And this was the most holy place because when the cloud would be over this place, God would be present there. And there was one day of the year when that priest would be allowed to go into that place and offer up a sacrifice. And the author of Hebrew fir firmly places Jesus in line of that service, that high priestly service. Even as far back as chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Romans chapter 3 says that he did that by his own blood. So the scriptures are teaching this propitiation, which is a removing of the wrath of God against sin, the sins of his people, Jesus performed that as our high priest by offering himself. As it were, he is the means of God's mercy towards us, is what that means, in his sacrifice. And this is one of the ways that he is described as the high priest. Uh, but the high priestly office comes as a result, as we saw there, of his humanity. In order to be a high priest, according to Hebrews 2.17, Jesus had to be made like us. This is what enabled him to die. This is what enabled him to be crucified, to bleed. He had to become human. But the Bible says that there's more than that with regards to Jesus's high priestly office. There's something unique about his high priestly office that he didn't share with any of the Levitical priests before him. The, Levit the Levitical priests line, the high priestly line comes in the first place from Aaron and by succession through family, through that lineage. And in Hebrews, we won't go there right now, but Hebrews talks about that there's a weakness in that and that these only live for a little while. And they're offering up these sacrifices insofar as they live. And we know that the blood of bulls and goats will never propitiate for sins absolutely it had to be continual year after year and after year but in Christ he has died once and for all time but he also doesn't have the same weakness as the Levit Levit Levitical priesthood had and that is described in that fourth verse of Psalm 110 when it says the Lord has sworn that's the first element Jesus has his office by an oath. And I'm not really going to focus on that, but that's important. The second element that is important, and this is really our focus today, is it says you are a priest forever. You are a priest forever. And this comes, it says in verse 4, because he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is very interesting. In God's wisdom, he means for us to see that there is a lineage of priesthood here. It's not as if Melchizedek is the lineage from which Christ comes per se, but he is the type. Melchizedek is this type of priest in which Christ can be identified, but there's something very unique about Melchizedek. He's this mysterious king priest found in Genesis chapter 14, who blesses Abraham and receives from Abraham a tithe, a tenth, He's called the priest of the Most High God in, or in Genesis 14, 18. And God promised to Abraham, preceded the law by 430 years, so too did this blessing of Melchizedek, this high priest of God, his blessing upon Abraham pre preceded the Levitical priesthood by the same amount of time, if not more. Over 400 years before Leviticus, or Leviticus Levi, and Abraham or Aaron and the Levitical priesthood would start carrying out this high priestly order, you have this mysterious figure, Melchizedek. And the thing is, in Genesis, he's extremely mysterious. Seems like he comes out of nowhere. We don't know anything about where he comes from or where he's going. He's just the king of Salem, the king of peace. He's the high priest of God. And the author to the Hebrews says, what Psalm 110 is telling us is that Jesus, the Messiah, has a priesthood like Melchizedek. So there's a connection here to this Old Testament, this promise, this great person of the priesthood of Melchizedek 
But I would argue that what we see always in Scripture with shadows and fulfillment of the shadows, with types and antitypes, is that the antitype or the fulfillment is always much greater than the type itself. And that's what we see in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds, that is, Christ holds his priesthood permanently. Do you hear that? Because he continues forever. And that's based off an oath from God and this lineage of priesthood that is an eternal lineage. The result, then, is that Christ is an eternal priest. What does that mean? Well, as I said, the the priest mediates. That is his purpose. He's a mediator between God and man. And the purpose of Christ's eternal office of priesthood is that he be an eternal mediator between God and God's people. Verse 25, this is the end result of his eternal mediation. Consequently, this is Hebrews 7, 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through, through him. Those two words describe the office of the mediator. Through him, through Christ. Since why? since he always lives to make intercession for them. We heard this morning, he lives. Simple. Kyle said this is something our children understand, and they do. When we teach them Jesus died on the cross, we teach them they understand how simple that is. When we teach them he was buried, that is understandable. We teach them he rose again, they understand that, and they don't question, not that it's possible, but that this is the scriptural message of good news to us. It's as simple as that. And yet it is the power of God, isn't it? It's the wisdom of God on display. Jesus' endless life and God's oath in Psalm 110 says you are a priest forever. And that means in verse 22, it means this about Jesus. This makes Jesus, this is Hebrews 7 verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, Some translations say instead of guarantor, he's a surety or he's a guarantee. Those words are fine as far as they are teaching what Jesus is. But I like the word guarantor because it's personal. Understand this. Jesus is not a guarantee for anybody if he does not live. Do you see that? It is in him that all the promises of God for us come to pass. And that does not mean it's in him as a teacher who lived a long time ago, or an example, or a righteous man, or a, a religious leader, or a thought leader, or a revolutionary, or a martyr, merely. It doesn't mean any of those things standing on themselves that Jesus is a guarantee because of them. He is a guarantor because he lives. That is what is needed for somebody to be a guarantor. They need to be alive. They must be alive. Beloved, Jesus' ongoing life is the surety, is the guarantee that we will come to God. In salvation. He is the surety of salvation. 
in himself. What I want us to see this morning is that very truth. Very simply, every aspect of our salvation depends on Christ's life, his ongoing life. Do you hear me? Beloved, there are Christian traditions this morning that will tell their people the resurrection is merely an analogy for us to be new kinds of people, to strive for change in our own life, to be better. If that is the good news, it's not good news. I don't know if you've noticed this in your life, but we are not getting better as we live our life in many ways. I'm 41 now. My knees are falling apart. My eyes are falling apart. I can't sleep sometimes. I have all these weird things going on. I'm still 41 only, right? I remember hearing growing up, Getting old is not for wimps. And I never understood it. And I'm, I'm bashful to confess to you that I'm understanding it a little bit more now. This life is a little blip. It's a vapor. Who's strong? Who's sufficient for this life? You say, well, if we do great and noble and mighty things, you might be so great one day that you might have a statue of yourself made and the next generation will come and push it over because they don't like the way that you acted anymore. You see, man is fickle. We're changing. We're fickle. We're all over the place. We're sporadic. We don't find within ourselves if we have any level of honesty, hope. You know, I don't know about you, but the horizon for mankind is, it seems like everything is up in the air. We don't know up from down, left to right, male from female. We are on a track for artificial intelligence with if you're somewhat nerdy like me, that's alarming. I'm from Montana. We want to go up into the mountains about this time, right? We want to drop our phone, all this tracking stuff. We want to get out from underneath all of this surveillance, right? There's a God in heaven. And he sees and he knows everything. And he's good. And he gave his son. And his son is the Lord of all and he lives. And salvation comes through his life, beloved. I want us to look at that. How does salvation in every way the scriptures teach about it depend on the life of Jesus? First, justification. What is justification? It's that God declares you to be righteous. Why? Because he looks at you and he says, oh, your your good works, your good works just outweigh your bad. That's the 51% Islam teaches the 51% idea. If you're 51% better than, than you are evil, then justice demands. That's not the way that God's justice works. It's even us. Even us, it's not the way it works. It's not the, the hundred women that you come in contact with that you never rape. And the one you rape that we weigh you against and say, oh, Yeah, you're a good person, right? That's a terrible analogy, but I want to drive it home. It's not the hundred truths that you tell and the one lie you tell whose ripple effects destroy lives. It's not the little bit of greed that you abstain from and the full amount that you just heap on yourself in a moment. Oftentimes, we know who we are by our sins, even if it's just one in this life. And how many do we accumulate before Almighty God who is holy and who not even one sin could enter into His benevolent and blessed heaven? 
God justifies us not on the basis of our righteousness, but on the basis of Christ's righteousness. What does that mean? That means the judge of all the earth looks at sinners and he no longer sees the sinner that we are. He sees Jesus Christ standing as our mediator, as the lamb who was slain in our place on the cross on Good Friday. But more than that, because that lamb rose. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, 24 and 25, it, that is righteousness, God's righteousness, will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. That means you believe the gospel of God concerning the Son. Do you hear what it says? You believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses so that our trespasses would be forgiven. They were put upon him and he was raised up for our justification. You see, when Jesus died for our sins, he really paid it all. He's sufficient to pay it at all. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that it was impossible for death to hold him. Why? Because the justice of God was already met in his death. And so in his resurrection, it is shown that God is just to pronounce us just because sin has been paid for. But what is needed? The risen Christ, the life of Christ. Salvation as a general topic of salvation has to do with justification, sanctification, and glorification. Our sanctification, in this sense, we talk about for progressive sanctification, that we are being changed moment by moment, glory by to glory, little by little, slowly we are being conformed into the image of God, and that begins now for believers. What does that mean? That means we're not in bondage to sin like we used to be. That means Satan is not the rule over our, our, our lives anymore. He is not the head. He's not our Lord. We don't receive our marching orders for him, from him. We are set free from slavery to sin. And we are to commit ourselves as slaves to righteousness. But even that depends on the risen Christ. Romans 6, 9 through 13. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Listen to this. This is as a result of that. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Not merely in justification, but in the actions that we take in this life. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from life, from death to life. Do you hear that? It's the resurrection of Christ that teaches us then how we then ought to live in this life and actually are able to live by grace and your members to God as instruments for righteousness that's based on the resurrection of Christ. The living Christ is the means whereby we will have victory over sin in this life. It's in the gospel. It's in the good news that he lives. Glorification is that doctrine with regards to salvation that is the end of our faith. Every spiritual blessing that God has promised to us will come to fruition when we talk about glorification, we talk about that eternal state of blessedness. The estate of our completed salvation, Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined what? What in eternity was predestined? To be conformed to the image of his son. Now, I believe that implies the risen Son. You cannot understand that apart from the risen Son. Why do I mean that? Well, I'll explain. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
What's very interesting about that firstborn among many brothers is that is an illusion. It's the same analogy. It talks about it in Revelation in the old uh, the King James translation, it, it uses the term, he opened the matrix. The matrix, that's a term of the womb, having to do with the resurrection. Jesus was the first one in God's economy to pass through death victoriously. And because of that, those who are in Christ are passing through victoriously because of him. That's the same analogy. The first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, is another way of describing it. Jesus is the first fruits. Him, he is first. And if you know about harvest, the first fruit, you know what you expect after the first fruits? The rest of the harvest. Jesus is the first by his resurrection. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. It is as certain as God's eternal plan in him, it is settled. And it depends on Christ's life. And he lives. We see that at the end of Romans chapter 8. We won't go there because there are many other ways and many other illusions and truths with regards to glorification. There's four, I believe I have four here, that I want you to think about that all depend on Christ's life. They all have to do with glorification. And the first is this, our resurrected bodies are made in the fashion of Christ. In other words, for us to, to have a hope of resurrection, biblically speaking, it's a bodily resurrection. And the Bible says our bodies will be made in the fashion of Christ. Romans 8, 23 says, and not only the creation, by the way, that's also redeemed by Christ's life. All that God created will be made new. That is a great hope of the Christian. God made everything good. And this creation groans under the weight of our sin. But we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions of Son. And here's how that's defined. The redemption of our bodies. Don't be thinking that just because something's physical, it's evil. Don't be thinking that. That's Gnosticism, it's a heresy, it's not true. Christ had a physical body, and when he was raised, he had a physical body. Now there's mysteries to his body. Uh, I did a whole teaching on this subject a few years ago on Easter. But our bodies will be redeemed. There won't be any more aches and pains, no more knee stuff replacement. There won't be any more uh, getting older one day. We're going to be like him. Why do I say we're going to be fashioned after his own body because of his life? Paul implies this 1 Corinthians 15, 20, that Christ in the first fruits of those is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And he means there that just as Jesus was raised with a new body, so will we. Our resurrection will be like his is the point. I hope you know that. But Paul says explicitly in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, but our citizenship is in heaven. By the way, this is why we long for Christ's return. It's not just because we're griping and complaining about life here. We better not do that because we can't be unthankful, right? We must be thankful. But we also long because our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, listen to this, Transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That's Psalm 110 verse 1. All things subjected under his feet. Secondly, glorification. Under that same heading, glorification. Our righteousness will be like the risen Christ's righteousness. Our righteousness. One day we will not fight temptation against sin at all. Some of us know that we fight it less and less as we're in Christ. We still fight it, certainly. Sometimes temptations will come up that we've never faced before. But one day we will not be tempted to sin because we won't want it at all. Like 
his righteousness, we will be righteous. While Jesus' resurrection is the basis for our sanctification now, that process, it is the ultimate means of our eternal righteousness. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now. Isn't that amazing? What manner of love is this that we should be called the children of God? And what we will be has not yet appeared. What will we be? But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. What does it mean we shall be like him? The context is clear here that being like him means primarily to be free from sin. No more having sin nature. No more sinning at all. Chapter 3, verse 7 of 1 John says this, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. That is the end of our faith. Do you want to be righteous like Christ? If not, you're not going to like heaven. You're not going to like eternity. You know, this idea that a Christian can be a Christian and then just be completely comfortable in sin is so preposterous. And I worry for so many who have been taught that heresy and believe it and live it. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Those works are revealed as sin. Yes, that does not mean we are perfect now in our righteousness, but it does mean we have a desire for righteousness, that we confess our sins, we repent, but one day there will be no more repenting we will be like Jesus in this respect. We will be like him when we see him as he, as he is. Do you hear that? Not as he was before the cross or before his ascension, but as he is. Third, under glorification, we will be immortal like him. Immortal. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I'll read through verse 57. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> right? Thank you for revealing this mystery, God in heaven. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Some of us need to hear that. Some of us need to know that about our loved ones if they are in Christ and facing death. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that victory mean? Immortality. That's what it means. It means never being defeated. Why? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is because he's a priest forever. Hebrews 7, 16. He's a priest forever, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Jesus died once. He could never be killed again. Never. Will he lay his life down again? His one sacrifice is the one hope. It's the great hope, beloved. It's sufficient. And his ongoing life is indestructible. Beloved, that's why the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Because we're his body. 
because he's the chief cornerstone of this temple he's building up. He's our footing. He's the head of the church. Jesus rested the promise of our eternal life. Listen to this. Jesus rested the promise of our eternity, our life, our eternal life on his own life. John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Yesterday we saw the Hare Krishna people singing in Kapha. And one of the tenets of Hare Krishna, if you'll notice that woman, she's got a cross on. One of the tenets is basically their main tenet is everybody is the same. Everybody is acceptable. As long as you're sincere, God accepts you. Beloved, that may sound like loving, but that is a denial of Jesus Christ. It is not loving. It is to reject him. Jesus does not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through their sincerity. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. Beloved, he proved this because he is the only one that was raised from the dead after being judged by Almighty God. Cursed because of our sin. No sinner could take that. No sinner could receive the judgment of God and walk away three days later from the grave. Our only hope is in Christ, and it is a great hope, and it's a hope that we need to take to every creature. Do not be persuaded by this world that tells you it's unloving to go to Kenya and preach the gospel to the Samburu people that say, oh, that man who died a few years ago going into this unreached people group whom he loved to tell them about this Christ died in vain. I saw Christians saying stuff like that. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it will not bring forth fruit. Beloved, the Christian church needs to start standing on the truth of our risen Savior so that we will be motivated to go and preach this good news. Otherwise, what are we living for? We cannot live for comfort in this world for ease of life. It's vanity. This is victory. Yes, I am grateful for breakfast. I'm grateful for this beautiful place. But if we just lay back and have ease and, and just look around us and how comfortable can we make ourselves in this life? We are hiding this light under a bushel. That's not why it's been given to us. The salt of the earth has lost its savor. And we're not going to rejoice in this truth. And we're not going to feel the weight of it as we ought to. We're not going to worship as we ought to. Beloved, here's this news. Jesus says, because I live, you shall live also. That is good news. Why? Because he lives. <laughs> that would have been terrible news if he would not have risen. But it is the greatest news because he lives. Fourth, and this is the greatest of all news that we have. In our glorification, this means eternal fellowship with God. I wish this whole thing should be a sermon now because this has to do with all that God created at the beginning when he said it was very good and the first Adam failing and all of humanity being plunged into sin and to ruin and to death and misery and the second Adam coming in fulfillment of all the promises and the failures of the law but in fulfilling the law and all the promises righteously living before God, dying in obedience on the cross, the humble 
cruel death he died in our place, being buried and risen again, means that in the end, at the very end, all eternity is going to be given back to God. Everything will be made new. And God will be all in all. Our salvation is total. The change is complete. There is nothing left out of God's plan to remake everything. How does he do it? Through human intuition, ingenuity, wisdom, and power? No, we saw that at 1 Corinthians. No, it's through the cross. It's through the death. It's through the burial. It's through the resurrection of Christ. We will be with God. The great promise, I think, that comes to us in Scripture is that God will be our God and we will be His people forever. Jesus said, John 14, 1 through 6, as He was getting ready to depart, to go to the cross, He's telling His disciples this. He's telling them many things. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, by the way, this has everything to do with this high priestly work. I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Where do we come? To the Father. Genesis 17, 8. This promise was given to Abraham. I will be their God. That promise was reiterated in the new covenant promise of Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Beloved, this happens because of Christ's life. In the revelation of Christ, in chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, the book of Revelation, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Beloved, we may disagree on this, but I'm so convinced that this is not a picture of a big cubicle building coming down out of heaven. This is a picture of the church. This is the church he's alluding to here. What is it? Like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. How many thrones are there? One throne saying, Behold! The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Here's what I want us to see. There is one throne, and yet there are two persons that inhabit that throne. Chapter 21, verses 3 through 5. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. The Lamb is living, beloved. And His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. 
They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And the promises of God in Christ are all yes, and in him, amen. As a minister of the good news that Jesus died according to the scripture, that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scripture, and all those who repent of their sin and believe on this Savior, this Lord of all, this Jesus Christ, who lives, will be saved. Everything that I've said about salvation will come to pass as certainly as he lives. He asked this question to Mary, Martha, do you believe? Do you believe? To Christ's bride, I say, while we still await the final day of our salvation, that salvation is as sure for us as the fact of Christ's resurrection and eternal life, which we believe in, which we hope, in which we rejoice. He is our high priest. He died once, never to die again. He lives forever to make intercession for us. No one can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus because no one can defeat Christ. No one can conquer him. No one can destroy him. He lives and he always lives as our mediator, our high priest. He will make all things new and you and I, the church, will be with God forever because he lives. Beloved, he is risen. Let's pray. Father.